artists are visually oriented. They learn visually. That's why the visual building blocks of painting will help you to paint better in any medium or style. Judy Wagner and I developed this system while working on one of our art instruction books. After years of looking at our own work and that of our students, we found that most painting problems fall into eight major categories. The same problems seem to repeat themselves over and over again. I feel that once students are aware of these problems, they can then learn to avoid them. And thus, these recurring stumbling blocks can actually be, re be turned into building blocks with which to paint better paintings. These building blocks will be explained with lots of helpful examples and advice from great masters of the past as well as some of today's painters. Through the ages, a lot of good painting advice has been passed down to us to form helpful guidelines. Basically, I have taken many of these guidelines, wrapped them into neat bundles, and designed a graphic symbol for each category. Remember, a picture is worth a thousand words. Once you know the meaning of each symbol, they'll serve as an instant visual reminder of what to do during the painting process. The major recurring painting problems are value or tonality, alternation, shape or silhouette, balance, dominance, gradation, depth, and focal point. Let's take a close look to see how other artists have turned these stumbling blocks into building blocks and how they can help you to paint better. And it doesn't make any difference what medium you are using. In the beginning phases when we start to paint, we look at all the pretty colors that we see on our palette and we have this tendency to put down all those nice colors with actually not paying much attention how dark or how light a color is. That's, that's basically the, the first building block and uh, the first problem that we encounter, values or tonality. And therefore, I would like you to see our symbol right here. Uh, these three values right here, the light value, the mid value, and the dark value are the ones that we use the most in all our paintings. This is where most of the colors are. Then in addition to that, we use the accent color, or the accent of the white, and the accent of the very dark colors that we use as in the as um, shown in the border of our symbol. I think what we should do is keep our values simple. You can see there are only three here. In reality, we have a lot more values out in the landscape or the still life or whatever we're painting. These three values are much like a musical chord. In other words, you'd have the, if they were, if they, if, if you could sing them, they would go bum bum bum. A nice chord of values that you need in all your paintings. This is where all the colors will be in that range. Let's look at John Singer Sargent. He used the white in the little section right in here, and balanced it with the little section right here. Then he used the light tone right in this area, right about here. Then he goes to his mid-value, or mid-tonality, and he uses that more around the edges. And then he goes and uses the darkest tones for some of the accents, and the black, or very dark value, is represented in the doors and the, and the figures as well. Another artist who uses these values very nicely is John Pike in, again, a scene done in Venice. Let's look at the lights here. Now, we don't exactly have white in this, but we have very light values. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be pure white. It can be just a very light value that you use. So we have a light value here and a light value here. Reflections are balanced. And then we go to the first tone. 
the first tone is represented in some of these areas right in here, and here, and in the water, and back in here, and back in this building right there. We go to the mid value, and there's lots of mid value in this painting, and it's distributed throughout the painting. Then we go to the darker values that are uh, again throughout the painting, and for the very dark, we look into the gondola and the very dark reflections in here as well. Now, what is so nice about this uh, tonality symbol is it also helps you when you go out on location to find a subject matter. You actually, when you go to on location, what you should do, you should really listen for the subject rather than actually look with wide open eyes. You should squint, because when you squint, then all the surface details are no longer there, and you see the big masses, just like they're represented, represented right here in this symbol. For instance, let's go out and take a look at this scene right here. If we were to uh, hum this scene, we would only have one tone. The, we do not have the three values in this uh, scene that, we, that we're looking at right now. Therefore, it's not really all that great to paint. We go a step further and we see this wonderful tree with all its textures uh, along the riverbank. We have more values this time, but if we squint down the the values are there, but the shapes, which we're going to get into later, are not all that clear. And it's very easy for us to be sidetracked by the surface details, the textural details of the subject, rather than uh, being aware of how the, how the subject holds itself together. Another uh, view would be this uh, scene right here. Now, there you can clearly hear these tones. You have the high notes, you have the mid tones, and then you have the nice dark ones. So here is bum, 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 and you have a subject. And then, if you want to, or if you're lucky, in the middle of that subject, you can place that wonderful accent white by, for instance, putting a little barn roof in there, and you maybe a little shed to the front of it. Now you have the little accent of the white that you need, as well as that good punch of very, very dark, and you have it at a beautiful point. This particular photograph also reminds us, basically, that Sky values are different from Earth values. Basically, the sky is the light giver, and Earth is light receiver. Therefore, Earth, as a result, most of the time is darker than sky. So the values in the Earth are darker than the sky, with the exception, of course, of man-made objects, like, for instance, the building. That could be lighter than the sky. Um, a road could be the same value as the sky. Number one, you've got to believe your own eyes. You need to go out there and you need to take a look and, and really compare these values to um, the values that are next to it. This is the landscape, but this applies the same way to the um, still life or the portrait. When you're selecting still life material, pick something that is in the light range, pick something that has this light value range, pick something that has some mid value range and some dark value range. Um, also, it's quite helpful sometimes to take a little piece of white paper and pin it somewhere in your uh, still life where a good light is falling on it because that is your known quantity, that is your white the same white as your tube white or the white of the paper if you're working in watercolor. Um, the same would apply, of course, with the figure as well. Basically, what you should think about is not so much the surface details that you're looking at, but more the big masses of values. Lots of times I tell my students, don't be an artist, be a light meter. Because a light meter 
cannot see surface details. They cannot be waylaid by all the surface details that are out there. I call it the siren call of surface details. And that's tricky. And, but a light meter doesn't see those. A light meter can only see how light or how dark a certain area is. And you'd be surprised if you put down those values just the way they are as a light meter would see them, you'd be amazed how little surface detail you would actually have to put on top of it to make it a believable painting. Oregon Remembered is a painting that I did along the coast in Oregon, and it is a wonderful example of the three values. When you squint down, you can see that there are three major values there. Yet when you open up your eyes, then you can see that within the foam, for instance, you have a nice breakup of different values. And even within the rock areas right here and here, you have a different uh, a, a variation of values, and yet they group together as, th as only three values. Your eyes are wonderful tools. And the nice thing is that you have your eyes always with you when you're painting. Uh, you should um, really be aware of how your eye works, because this is so helpful when you're thinking about values and when you're thinking about color. So let's make a little diagram to show you how your eye actually works. So here we have the eye. And the way it works basically is if you are looking at something here, it is, it's back in here is where you will be seeing it. Now, in this area, we have predominantly a set of nerves called cones. And cones, the job of cones is to see color. So if you want to know what something is, you look right at it, and it's, it's the red shirt or the green tree or whatever it is. Now, the peripheral vision, anything that is over here and here is taken up with another set of nerves predominantly, and those nerves here are called rods. And the job of rods is to see values. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you want to see a color, you look into the area. And if you want to see how light or how dark that color is, you look next to the area. You look over here to find out how dark or how light this area is. It's much the same as this board right here. You could, for instance, in order to find out how light this is, you look next to it. Or you can, in, uh, you can also, by looking at this, become aware of how dark this is. And this is so important when we're dealing, for instance, in the landscape with uh, trees that are outlined against the sky, or a, a roof outlined against the sky. Always look at the sky, and it will tell you how dark the trees are. And of course, it works the same way in still lives and figures as well. Look into it for the color. Look next to it to find out how light or how dark the object and the color is. OK, I think that will be quite helpful for you. And I think that will uh, make us get us ready for the next step and the next building block. Alternation is our second building block. It's really the building block that clarifies everything. And uh, it goes back again to our first building block, which was values. If we use our values correctly, we will have alternation happening for us in the painting. Often, however, what happens is that we get uh, with all the pretty colors, we put all the pretty colors down, and we come up with a mid-value, with a mid-value type of uh, painting like this, where everything is a bit on the light side. That's uh, very much like mumbling. We, we're not saying things very clearly. We can say things with more punch and get more excitement in a painting. 
As you can see, the alternation building block shows us that there should be a light against the dark and a dark against the light. It does not have to be um, black and white. It can be many different values, but it should definitely be a, a clear clarification of a, a light against the dark. And this can be applied in uh, all our paintings. For instance, this painting I did in California. And the same alternation happens again. If you would turn this building block a bit sideways, you could see this is a dark, and this is a dark, and here is a light, and here is a light. Um, in this area as well, this post is dark when it's surrounded by a light, and it is light when it's surrounded by a dark. Light against dark, this is our story. Look at this painting by Milford Zorns. It is very clear as to light, dark, dark, light, dark, light. All the way through, he, he keeps those values clearly stated. Light, dark, light. Then he goes to a dark again, then lighter again. Again, it doesn't have to be black and white. Here is uh, another example of these alternation at work, much in a checkerboard fashion. If you look, you will see that basically you have a dark area here, and that means that, that therefore that chimney has to be light. Now, in this area, the chimney becomes dark again. Look at this checkerboard. Here we have a dark against the light, and a dark against the light. What happens so often, however, we are so involved in our painting that, for instance, in an area like this, we might say, oh, I want to place a figure there. So we're going to place a figure there, and then we say, okay, well, that's pretty nice. Now, what color should that figure be? And we're going to paint, and we're going to say, well, let's, let's put uh, blue jeans on the person, and so we do that. And then we say, okay, now let's see, what, what will the person's top be? And we are going to paint some kind of a color that um, will be ideal for the top. And we put this color down again, not paying attention to what value it is. And so what happens then is we, we, what, we, what's, what we're doing is we're placing darks against dark, and that will not work. Um, by the time you have a, a face on there like that, and you squint down, you've lost the figure. So this is a good example of keeping, a, uh, keeping figures light when they're against a dark area, and dark when they're against a light area. In addition to that, uh, I can enlarge on the alternation symbol because this is really a checkerboard. And uh, we have a little diagram that we can do to see how the checkerboard works from the regular checkerboard to the artistic checkerboard to how we actually apply it in a painting. Let's take a look at what a checkerboard looks like. A checkerboard is very simply like this, a couple of things, lights against the darks, and it has to be that way. If it weren't that way, you would not be able to distinguish the checkerboard. So light against dark, dark against light. Now the artistic checkerboard, on the other hand, is much more fun, and it's an exercise that I'd like you to consider doing, because it, it teaches you uh, balance, and it teaches you about s shapes as well. The artistic checkerboard, we're going to use um, different size checks. Let's, let's see how it works. We'll take, for instance, one over here, and we'll make it a rectangle, and we'll balance it with a very small one like this, and then come in with a skinny one like this. And what we're doing, we're at the same time looking at the left over right spaces at the same time. This is quite heavy at this side, so I need to balance that with a heavy weight on this side. So there is another 
one. How about a small, tiny little check right here? And so we can go on. Uh, what we're doing, we're, we're balancing, we're balancing, and we're breaking up the white areas. And the white areas are just as important as the dark areas. Let's make that a more interesting shape. Let's make it a little bit longer. Now we have a much more interesting uh, white space left over. What happens if we were to place a small, well, let's make it a little bit larger. Larger check here. Let's not make it the same size as that one. And how about another base check right here? And we can go on and make this one a little bit larger. What we have done, we still, we, we are still alternating. We're still saying light against dark, dark against light, but we are making it more interesting. We are making the um, uh, dark spots more interesting as well as the leftover white spots here. Now at this point I say, oh, I really need a little check about right there. And what if we were to make a little one just there? And how about, and so we're refining this thing. How about making one here? And so, so we're constantly playing with the negative space and the positive space. The only drawback about this is that when you're saying checkerboard, automatically people will start thinking about rectangles and uh, uh, or squares, and that is not the case because basically it can be any shape you like it to be. It basically has to be a dark against the light. And I have a good example of that uh, right here is, for instance, an example of this tree area uh, and the house behind it. And it would be fun as an exercise for you to draw something like that and then to try and switch the values. What would happen if, if the roof were dark, for instance? Then that would mean that the tree would have to be light next to it. So let's take a look how the different possibilities exist for using that same sketch, but then constantly using different. Uh, if, if one area is dark, then that means that the that the area next to it has to be light. This would be a great exercise for you to try at home. And that brings us to our next building block. Silhouette is our third building block. And it's very similar to the previous one, which was alternation, light against dark, dark against light. It's the, as you can see here, we have the S is visible with the light background. And the S is visible against the dark background because then it's light. So it is, in essence, it's alternation again. It's very important to do the telltale silhouette that you need to explain what you're painting. I remember very well years ago when I went to an art class where we had the still life in the middle of the room. And the early birds would set up and get the best angles. Well, I would always be late. I would come in and uh, find a leftover spot. And from where I was painting, I very carefully painted this item right here. And I tried very hard to make it look what it, what it should be. Had I, however, stepped over a couple of spots, I would have seen that this is the telltale story of a pair. So, uh, which, which means that when you are out on location, walk around the subject, become aware of what the best angle of that subject is. For instance, we can look at, uh, out on location, we can look at a spot and we can see, yes, it does have all those values we needed to look at in the first building blocks, but it is jumbled. If we were to paint this, it would be hard to explain to the viewer as to what was going on. Also, what happens quite often is that one silhouette outline will steal the beauty away from the other silhouette outline. So we need to look for that. 
in this case, for instance, there's a beautiful outline of this Mesa backdrop, but it is stealing the show away from the building. The building is not visible from this particular angle. So you have a choice. You can move around then and find an angle so that this uh, building is again visible against the sky. Selecting a subject is, as we said in the beginning, you need to squint and you need to, when you, when you squint down and you clearly see the shapes that clearly explain themselves, you've got a subject, as we can see in this uh, photograph right here. When you squint down, you can clearly see, oh, I see a roof, I see edges of a building, and uh, trees and, and so on. They're all clearly uh, defined shapes. There's quite a difference between painting and drawing. In drawing, we deal with lines to describe a subject. And in actuality, the, these are demarcation lines from one area to another area. And in reality, uh, there are very few lines in nature. You might have some in riggings or twigs and so on, but there are no lines running around trees or buildings. Um, the artist who draws deals strictly with lines and does not pay any attention to the effect of the light source. So we're getting the outlines of all the things quite clearly in the drawing. Now, a painter, on the other hand, does not deal as much with lines. A painter deals with shapes. And therefore, the painter has to look at light source. Where is the light side and where is the dark side of a building or a landscape or a still life or whatever it may be? And then, Basically, now this is really simplifying a lot, but basically all you need to do after you have identified and designed nice shapes, all you need to do is put the right color and the right value within each shape. In this particular painting, it's a small one that I did years ago. It is very clear that we use good shapes, but we use positive shapes and we use negative shapes. If you work from the top, in the top part of the painting, for instance, you see all the leaves nicely displayed in dark colors. Then, when the background becomes dark, I have opted to leave all the leaves light and white. And then when we go lower down into the painting and the background has disappeared, we again say the painting, uh, the leaves in dark. I like painting boatyards. In this particular case, I'm in California in a boatyard. And to me, the telltale shape that I need to include in a, a boat like this is the rudder and the propeller. And it was actually not visible in this case because there was another dark boat right behind it. And I opted to leave that boat out in order to really tell you about the shapes that to me are important, telltale shapes of a ship. Shapes can be a lot of fun. I think shapes, uh, of, of course, we need to have shapes that exp express what it is, but at the same time in painting, if we with one shape can say several things, we're better off. Let me illustrate that point. For instance, you could paint a piece of foliage like this, piece of foliage or a bush or whatever, but if you can come down and at the same time say this kind of an outline and pick it up and explain it a little bit more. Now we have said with the same green sh or black shape in this case, we've said two things at once. We have said foliage and we have said picket fence. Try to say a number of things at once. Let's look at some shapes. This right here, anytime the measure the horizontal and the vertical measure is the same. We have a dull shape, a shape that we should avoid. So this circle, the square, and the equal lateral triangle 
are shapes that we should avoid using. You've already seen that the uh, pair looked at from the circle angle is not a telltale shape. Immediately it becomes a better shape if we turn around and do something like this. And we have a better, now we are, we having a different measure. This measure is long and this measure is short. We could, for instance, um, take the open barn door as suggested by this square and look at it from a different angle and have a more interesting shape, especially if we have things cutting into it. These particular shapes right here uh, are just pieces of paint. And what we need to do, we need to have shapes that interlock. If you look again at the symbol, you will see that the background interlocks into the S. And in both, ca in both cases, it, there is an interlock happening right here. So this is what we need to do in painting as well. We need to find, I call them jigsaw puzzle pieces, things that lock into each other. So it could be a, a light something or other, or something sticking out. Uh, the pear, for instance, could have a highlight on it, and then we would have a, a good excuse to have an interlocking. The shadow could be like that, and that would be an interlocking piece. So we have interlock, interlock, and interlock right there. Find an angle that is more interesting to than this equal lateral one. So possibly this could be a, a roof or a, um, a facade of a house. And so the minute you start angling this and put a shadow in, you are having a much more interesting shape happening than over here because it interlocks. Okay, it's wonderful to uh, talk basically about all these positive shapes. They're all positive, but we also have negative shapes as you have seen right here with this picket fence. This picket fence does not exist. It exists because of the, the dark area that I painted around it. But we do have, uh, we have to have an awareness of the negative shapes. And so, especially if you're working in a medium uh, like watercolor, because in watercolor you have to think ahead. In oil or acrylics, it's very simple. If you need a white, you just dip into the white and you put it in. But in watercolor, you have to learn to think ahead. And a good little exercise for that is to think of actually carving away. Think of, think of a, a, a piece of clay or stone and you're carving away everything that you don't need. So here is a, a, a fun exercise. What we do, we just start out with a kind of a wedge shape and maybe another wedge shape over in here. And then we put another little wedge shape and another one and possibly one in here. And we could go over here again and put another wedge. And let's see, let's make this one a little bit different and another wedge shape. And what we're doing in this particular case, we are putting down pieces of paint, but at the same time, out of the corner of our eye, we're looking at the leftover pieces of white to make sure that they are reading as what they should be reading. And you can go on with this and have a lot of fun creating a whole forest interior. Having little shapes, big shapes, fat shapes, they're all negative shapes. Nice little squished shapes. Now, what you need to do, you need to look at the, or actually in this case again, you need to really squint. What am I seeing? When you squint, all of a sudden it will start making sense to you. And I have some examples that I can show you. Here is an example 
of the, what we have just done before, but now this time we did it in color, try all the different greens. This would be a great uh, exercise to mix your greens and at the same time learn about the negative shapes that are actually carved out and as a result the trees become in, come into existence. Notice that uh, when the tree goes against the sky, you are free to say the same thing again in dark. So it all doesn't, uh, the whole tree does not have to be negative. It could be part positive and part negative. Here's another example of using the, the painting the background. It's great fun, and I would suggest that you that you try it. You you mix your colors in the background, and you and also you have to remember that no pencil was used in this. You place the piece of paint right onto the paper, and you start carving away. If you use the pencil, you really in this particular exercise you're kind of losing the benefit of it. You need to you need to work directly with the shape and kind of look at the shape and look at the negative uh, leftover piece at the same time. As you saw earlier in the photograph where we had the mesa and the building, uh, one silhouette can destroy the beauty of the other silhouette. So we have to be careful where we place our silhouettes. So they can, they can join but they have to place in such a manner so that one does still allows for the beauty of the other one. And one, in, in painting houses, it often happens that, for instance, we could have a house, but then there is a tree in front of it which obliterates what I call a crucial corner. Let me explain. If you were to give me and show me this angle of the house and possibly this little edge right there, and maybe this edge here, and possibly this edge here. Then what happens is that I can actually place anything I want in front of that. I can put a whole forest in front of that area and just obliterate it. doesn't make any difference. You can still see that Despite the fact that I covered all this up, you can still see that there's a house behind the foliage. And the same thing would apply, for instance, and often applies to when we're painting uh, boats and piers. The, the, the crucial outline, the crucial shape for a boat, one of them is this front part. But lots of times we will be uh, at the pier and just at that particular spot from where we are standing, that post is right there. And that, of course, would obliterate that crucial angle of the ship. So what we need to do, we need to come out and we need to reestablish that telltale edge, that telltale silhouette that tells us it is a ship. And I think that should be enough for this uh, building block and let's move on to the next one. Okay, we're at balance, which is our fourth building block, and it's the building block that adds solidity to your work. It was also one of the design problems I had because I really had a very, a very complicated design to start with, and then I simplified it to just balancing a triangle on its point to just remind you that we need to balance colors and we need to balance values. However, this particular symbol is really kind of the balance that we don't want to have in a painting. This is a formal or a symmetrical balance. In other words, everything on this side is the same as is everything on this side, and that is not that exciting in a painting. I think it's far more exciting to look at a painting like you are seeing right now on the screen, which is by Judy Wagner, a full sheet watercolor called Adobe Abode. And if you squint down, uh, you will see that the large foreground uh, area is balanced by the distant mountain and some of the, the little tree in the distance. That is a good example of asymmetrical or informal balance. Squint down and see how the whole painting holds together. 
Okay, next, I'd like to show you another good example by John Singer Sargent. Notice, again, it's important to squint down at this. Notice how he balanced his values extremely well. The darks on this side are just beautifully balanced with the darks that are on this side over here. Since we're in good company, we're going to talk about my, one of my paintings. Look at uh, the color balance that I have here. I have green on this side, and I have green on this side, yet the, the whole painting holds together with this piece of red that is, because there's as much here as there, again, is nicely balanced as well. Virginia Rodecker is a friend of mine, an oil painter, and again, if you squint down, you can really see the beautiful balancing job that she has done in this floral painting. Lastly, I'd like to point out a painting of mine that I'm not too happy with because the balance isn't uh, as well thought out as I had hoped to think it out. Uh, as you see here, most of the red is on the left side of the painting. Actually, I tried to balance. Um, when I was painting this, there were no red roofs over on the other side, but I said, gee, I have to balance this red, so I threw the red over there. However, it still is an unbalanced painting. A good way to demonstrate that is just by thinking about it like this. It is unbalanced. Another painting of mine, it is a series of trees, as you see, and notice how those trees are, the, the shadow underneath the trees is beautifully balanced with the distant headland on the left side. Also, the top part of the foliage is nicely balanced with the larger and lighter area of same color at the bottom of the painting. Balance is a very important uh, building block to remember when we do our preparation sketch for the painting because then what we are nailing down actually are the lights and the darks. And the lights and the darks can be perfectly balanced as in this first picture right here. But uh, the total result will be a very spotty painting and we don't want that. So what we need to do, we need to connect those spots to get a much more interesting uh, painting as we see in the second example. The next four building blocks that you're going to be seeing are the more advanced building blocks. The first four were more the beginning phase and now we're going to go into the more advanced phase, more complicated phase, yet they all interrelate with each other. And the first building block we will be touching on is dominance and I really feel that dominance is the building block that unifies everything. Dominance applies to many different things. In our symbol, for instance, we have a good example of space dominance. You all remember that you never place the horizon line in the center of the painting. So this is a good example of that. In this particular instance, um, this, if this were a painting, this would be all foreground and then the accent would be the sky. With the word dominance, we know that there is another word there and the, that word is accent. So, uh, but again, these interrelate with each other. So, for instance, if uh, dominance would not only be uh, applicable to space, but it could be applicable to color, dominant colors, or a dominant temperature, or dominant shapes, or dominant values. Think, for instance, uh, think of Rembrandt, for instance. What were the dominant values that he used? Let's go back to building block number one and see. The dominant uh, values that Rembrandt used were right in this area right here. He did use a few light ones in the faces and so on, but predominantly he used this area and the accent was right here. At the same time, if you think of, for instance, um, Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, 
and you think of the word shape. What's the predominant shape that Peter Paul Rubens portrayed? It was curvilinear. So you can see the interrelationship from how these, in, how these building blocks interrelate with each other. Okay, for some good examples and some bad examples. Here's a, a bad example uh, of mine. Uh, looking at this Mesa painting in New Mexico, you really do not have any color dominance whatsoever. Is it? You cannot say that it is a certain color painting because I have equal amounts of blue, equal amounts of red, and equal amount of green. We don't do those kind of things. But I did. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go back a minute to the dominant, dominance building block here of, of space division. And I have a good example of that in the George Sharapov oil painting that you see right here. So the predominant space division is ocean and the accent is the sky. Another beautiful example of dominance he has here is dominance of color. This is a blue painting with accents of the oranges, the orange tones in here. We were talking about Peter Paul Rubens a minute ago and his curvilinear shapes. Well, we have some wonderful painters today that use curvilinear shapes. Here is a painting by Pamela Penglaze. It's an oil painting. And as you can see, she used curvilinear rhythms throughout this painting, but she has accents as well. The accents of the straight lines, the straight lines, even this little line right here, those are straights, and the rest is all curves. So she has dominance of curvilinear, accents of straights. Another friend of mine is Ri Munoz, who is an Alaskan painter. And this is a poster of one of her tapestries. And I fell in love with this because it is so beautifully designed as a curvilinear type of design. Yet, look at these pikes, or spikes, or whatever you call them. They're nice and straight, but everything is curved. Also, from a color standpoint, Re Munoz does a good job because it's predominantly oranges and browns, but then she has that beautiful cool note in the water of the blue as well. I also have some slides that I'd like you to see as well. Going back to uh, the dominance of land versus sky, we could do the opposite. In Hill Country Sky, for instance, I have shown you the sky and I have accented the land by itself. Rembrandt is not the only one who can use very dark colors. Uh, in this painting of the uh, interior of the barn, I use very, very dark values and then accent the window and what light is falling through the window. You can use light values, or you can use a dominance of mid-values. Carmel Mission, for instance, is a good example of just using mid-values and a few darks to accent them. As I said before, there are many different ways to uh, use dominance. You can have dominance of color, value, uh, temperature. One of these, for instance, now the one that you're seeing right now on the screen is dominance of soft edges with the accent of the hard edge. But I'd like to point out a couple of paintings that I've uh, done over the years, and it's good for you to take a critical work, a critical look at your own work. This painting, for instance, right here, it's well painted, it's nice, nicely done, however, it reaches that half and half point. And if you look at the dominance symbol again, we don't have half and half. We don't have the horizon line in the middle of the painting. We have one area that predominates and the other one becomes the accent. So this one, I consider a half and half painting. 
Then we have this lovely painting right here that I'm quite proud of, uh, proud enough to do a poster on. It's, uh, I, all I can say on this one is that it is a dominance of temperature. It's a very warm painting. I'm a little bit questioning, though, as to what is the dominant color in this particular painting. But, you know, I think I'm going to design a ninth building block. And that ninth building block is going to say, so what? Because, you know, we, we can't be, we have to be critical of our work, but at the same time we should enjoy what we're putting down as well. Here we are at building block number six, and it's called gradation. And I like the word gradation, but basically you should think of that word as change, meaning change. Gradation is more thought of as a from to type of situation. So you could gradate from a light to a dark, or a dark to a light. And we have a diagram which we're going to show you. But uh, change is also uh, the, the very important thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be from to. For instance, in this uh, vignette poster of mine, I have a lot of change happening in the foreground area. I have uh, change of color. I have change of excitement, of spattering. Then the uh, negative posts cut out and the dry brush stroke over here. There is nothing dull about this particular area in the painting. If we were to paint just with flat washes, with flat areas, much like a silk screen, it could be quite well done. However, gradation adds excitement. Let's look at our symbol. If you notice, the, the background of our symbol gradates from a dark to a light. The G, on the other hand, does the other thing, does, does the opposite. It gradate, gradates from a light to a dark. That's a good example of reciprocal gradation, which we'll be talking about. What are the many different ways that we can gradate? Let's look at this chart right here. We've taken just the red the red dot. And we have, as I said before, we've gone from light, from dark, from that value right here, added water, or in oil you can add paint, to lighten the value. We can take the color and we can darken that value. We can take that same color and we can make that color more neutral. And so, in other words, we're going from chroma to gray. We can do an analogous change by going from yellow to, from yellow to orange to red. Or the other side of the color wheel, we can go from red to purple to blue. Those are all different ways we can gradate. Another gradation is just by marks. We can go from the big marks to the, to the wider spaced and less marks. That's a gradation in marks right here. So that gives you a wide range of possibilities in gradations. I think Frank Webb is a master at gradating, and we have a beautiful example of his right here now. It's called floral, and you would, you, will enjoy seeing the gradations of color as well as values in this nice watercolor. It is very difficult to keep uh, a body of water to lie down flat. And gradation is a wonderful tool that you can use for that purpose, as you can see in this painting by Judy Wagner, titled Monhegan Cliffs. I did a painting. Uh, which is a good example of how to use these, these marks we have talked about. We have the big marks in the foreground on this painting, which is titled The Price is Right. And so we have the big marks then receding to the actual boat, and 
the, and the marks are getting smaller. Finally, here's another wonderful example by Judy Wagner, and it's a good example of the uh, analogous slide that is happening when you look at the background behind the sugar house here, the background foliage as well as the uh, foreground foliage. In both cases, we see slides from a yellow to an orange to a red. And it just, uh, it's just, it's an underpainting type of thing, but it activates, it activates the painting. Here is a wonderful example of reciprocal gradation, and it brings things to life again, too. The values will reciprocate. For instance, if you look at the background behind the tree, the tree is light, and that same tree, as it appears in front of the sky, will become dark. And this is something that you need to, uh, the tendency is when you're painting to t in the beginning phase of your development to take brown and take it all the way from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. Look at the value changes that happen and see how uh, reciprocal gradation is used by a master like John Pike. Uh, in this particular case, we, we have a dark background, so he can just put the figure in light, and it's very obvious. But in this case, we have a figure that starts out light because the area around it is dark, and then it slowly slides to a dark where it needs to be because the area around it is dark, is light, excuse me, is light. Also, it is nice to animate a textural uh, subject such as this when you turn a corner. In other words, here we have the front facade of this gate in Oaxaca, Mexico. And so we have a, a dark area right here which slides towards the light. The side of it, however, does the opposite. It slides from the, from the dark to the light. Those are very subtle changes, but they really activate your painting very strongly. Okay, here we are at building block number seven, which I have titled Depth. I hate the word perspective because it stops so many people from painting. All they can think of is linear perspective, and that means they envision lines going in all directions. Actually, there are many different ways that we can, can gain depth in a painting without ever using linear perspective. And we will be uh, handling those with examples here. Actually, what, what we're more concerned about is atmospheric perspective rather than linear perspective. And to remind you of that fact, I have designed this symbol, which reminds me of a drive through the mountains. And it's a good example because then you can clearly see that the distant mountain is lighter than the mountain in front of you. That, that's atmospheric perspective at work. The curtains of atmosphere, the more layers of air are between you and that particular subject, the lighter, cooler, and softer edge things become. So those are all devices that we can use to create depth. There are uh, many others. For instance, you could use uh, the texture to create depth. Uh, Judy Wagner, in her painting that uh, is titled Behind the Inn, is a wonderful example. She, she handles the texture on the tree beautifully, and so that then becomes the, if you like, the focal point area uh, of the painting, and the house behind it is still indicated, but is rather softly in comparison indicated. Had she turned around and put just as much detail in the house as she did in the tree, that house would have immediately moved forward and you would lose that depth. So you can create depth just with textural attention. Another way to create depth is with value change. And this painting I did in Freedom, New Hampshire is a good example of that. You can see that the, 
distant trees are very, very light, and then as they get closer to you, they become darker and darker. So creating depth with value change. Another great device for creating depth is using overlapping shapes. In this particular painting, which I did in the Texas Hill Country, uh, I have the pole in the foreground overlapping the house and the uh, trees and the road and, and so on. So it's a good example of overlapping shapes. Another way to create depth would be with the quality of the edge. Soft edges recede, hard edges come forward. A good example of that is in the Ron Ranson painting, which you see right here. The softest edge is the one furthest away, right in the distance, right here. And as the subject, as the items come closer toward you, they become darker in value and also a bit harder in edge. So we're having two things at work here. We're having going from light to dark, as well as softest edge to the hardest edge of the tree right in the foreground. Another wonderful way to create depth is with a directional line. This could be a shadow. Quite often it's, it's used as a shadow. Or it could be a railroad track or a fence or something of that nature that really moves you into the picture plane. Richard Kaiser, a good friend of mine, has a good example here where he used the cast shadows of the trees to move you right into the painting and into the picture plane. Walter Gonski, another friend of mine, a good, wonderful oil painter, has a great example here of this snowy, wintry scene where, again, the shadows move beautifully into the picture plane. Another great way to create depth is with a diminishing repeat. John Pike used that uh, very well in this painting that he did in Greece where he repeated the windmills going smaller and smaller. You know they're all the same size windmills, but because they're smaller, they look like you're moving further back. It's called a diminishing repeat. I did the same thing in my painting, Vinyl Haven, afternoon. The foreground lobster shacks, uh, the foreground lobster traps are rather big, and then the mid, mid ones are smaller and get smaller. Same thing with the buildings. Uh, the, uh, the building in the foreground is large, and then it recedes in size. Here is a wonderful example of, of work by Brian Adio, who is a Canadian watercolorist. And it, it really shows clearly how he has kept the cool colors in the background and the warm colors in the foreground. And of course, from a value standpoint, it, it again is true too. The light colors in the background and the darker colors in the foreground. One more thing I'd like to point out here is the simplicity of the background. And as he moves forward, as he moves towards you, the scene gets more complicated. There are two more ways that you can create depth. And I'd like to show you those by example. One other way to gain depth is by gradation. And we do it all, all the time when we are painting a sky. Let me show you what we usually do in a painting. When we go to the sky, we put some blue down. We know that the darkest area of the sky is right kind of on the top of the painting or above our head. And then we gradate that down to a lighter lighter version and it gets lighter and lighter as we get to the horizon line and the reason for that of course is that there's more air between our eye and the horizon line than uh, there is air between our eye and right above our head so that's why that's the reason behind the gradation Okay, so we get lighter as we get down lower. We always do that. We virtually always do that. But we should also remember that we can use gradation at the bottom of the painting as well. So just by actually grade, putting a gradation in, we can already create depth. Uh, <coughs> for instance, a road or a field or whatever it is, if we start off 
with um, a, a certain value, and then we start gradating it towards the center of the painting and making it lighter again, you can see how just that alone, just by itself, will create depth. So don't forget that when you're, when you're painting. Gradate not only the sky, but the bottom as well. There's one other way we can g gain depth, and that's one we, where we do use lines, but we use them in a, in a more creative way rather than linear perspective. Let's talk about that. Uh, more than likely, uh, you're not aware of the fact, or you haven't possibly thought about it, but busy lines are the ones that are in the front, and uh, quiet lines are the ones that are in the distance. So just with the quality of your line, you can gain depth. Let's see how this works. For instance, you're at a scene, and you can see that uh, the, the foliage of the tree in front is doing all these kind of wonderful, busy things. And there we are. And then we have the trunk, and we have busy little grasses, and so on. Um, <clears throat> uh, a group of trees a little bit further back might be doing this kind of stuff. trunks, and so on. Then another series of trees on the distant mountain range might do this kind of stuff. And then the further mountain range behind that might do that. And the one behind that might really be quiet. So you have a, a wonderful example here of the busy lines in the front, and they get quieter and, and uh, flatter they flatten out as you go into the distance. That's for the general landscape. That's for the general landscape, but you can also use that in, in, in paintings close up. Now let's look over here back to the Fernandina Beach poster where I use this. Notice, for instance, just on this little walkway right here, on this little path, notice that the line in the front of the grass is going up and down and up and down quite active back in here, while the one on the other side of the path is rather quiet. So even in this short a distance, you can use that uh, quiet, busy line to gain depth. One more way to gain depth without ever bothering with linear perspective. Our final building block is the focal point, and the focal point pulls a lot of the other building blocks together into it. For instance, if you look at the symbol, you can see that we are using gradation in the focal point area by starting from a dark at the edge and then building up towards the light, much like a spotlight, onto the focal point area. We're using alternation as well. The strongest alternation is right at the focal point area. The lightest light against the darkest dark is used at the focal point area. You still have alternation at the edges as well. You can see where, where this arrow comes down. There is alternation, but it's not as strong as it is at the focal point area. If we were to use color in this particular painting, in this particular uh, symbol, then, uh, and, and all this would be green, then the dot would have to be red. Uh, another uh, item used in this uh, symbol is dominance. Predominantly, this is a, a square, and it's emphasized even more with the rectangles and the arrows happening in there. Therefore, the accent is, has to be the circle. And again, if it were color, this would have to be red if the rest of it were green. Now let's see how other artists through the ages and uh, today uh, have used and are using the focal point in their actual paintings. The next painting we're going to is Mary Cassatt's painting right here. And it's uh, titled uh, the loge, and as you can see, the portrait, the, the, 
the faces are right at the focal point area. I like this painting also because it has a dominance, again, of curvilinear shapes. Wherever you look, you will see that uh, you, you'll see curves. You'll see curves happening here, here. They're repeated the other way, curves curves. The only straight thing is this little section right here and right here, possibly this line. But that's, of course, when we're talking about um, dominance of shapes. If we, we're at the moment, we're talking about focal point. The next uh, painting I want to uh, point out is Edgar A. Whitney, who was a great watercolorist and a great um, instructor. And here, uh, Ed is using predominantly cool colors. But as he reaches towards the focal point area in here, he's using bright and warm colors at the focal point. The um, other thing that I need to point out about the uh, building block of the focal point is the arrows. The arrows right here are a good um, place, to, uh, a good definition as to where to place the focal point. Um, there have been many different rules, but the simplest one that I find is what the photographers came up with, which is the rule of thirds. Divide your uh, surface into thirds. Where the lines cross each other would be good places to do uh, to place the focal point. Mary Cassatt, for instance, placed her focal point not down here, but she placed it up here. So it's again on the third. Third and third and third and third. So that is a beautiful place for the focal point. Edgar Whitney did the same thing in his painting. He took the thirds and the thirds and the thirds here, and that is where he placed the only warm spot in his otherwise cool painting. So that's a good way to do it. You might not always work on a dimension, uh, you might want to work sometimes on a different dimension, but the rule still applies. Look how Brian Adio, our Canadian watercolorist, has used that. If we use the thirds about here and about here, those are the places where Brian has uh, uh, more interest. More than likely, your eye is going to go to this area before this one. So this will be really the focal point area right there. The reason for that being that this is the lightest area and against some very dark and active uh, details. So this is where the primary focal point is. However, he balances that on the third again with some more activity, but more of a quiet activity in comparison to this. There are many other ways to create uh, uh, attention at the focal point area. And let's take a look at some of those now. We can direct the eye with value contrast. And a good example of that is Judy Wagner's watercolor, Beyond the Village. And if you look at that, you can really see that, yes, we're, take, we're going all the way across the village of Monhegan Island, but she directs her eye to the distant headland where the darkest area is meeting the lightest area. So direct the eye with value contrast. This is a uh, watercolor titled The Hard Place, which I did on Vinyl Haven in Maine. The minute we place the human element in the painting, we can identify with, and this is where our eye immediately is going to go to, to the human element. It, might not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a figure. It could be a, uh, a building or a boat or whatever. The human element. So place the human element uh, in the focal point area. The unexpected visitor introduces the human figure again at a good focal point area right on the third. E. John Robinson is a California-based marine painter in oil, and we have two wonderful examples of his here. The Under the Cape painting 
really shows the most complicated uh, and busiest detailed area is right of the foreground rocks is right uh, at the uh, focal point area. And he takes the lightest light and he places it against the darkest dark right there in the focal point area. Anderson Valley is another one of his uh, warm, beautiful paintings. And the trees line up right there at the focal point on the one third. And actually the road and the light field behind form a, a triangle, a, a triangle which points again to the focal point area. One other way to get the attention at the focal point area is to lavish that focal point area with detail, as Judy Wagner did in this full sheet watercolor of a tree in New Mexico. Well, here we are. We have worked our way through the eight building blocks of design, and I think it'd be a great idea to review what we have talked about. So let's look at all of them together here. Uh, first, we talked about tonality or value, and it basically means that when we pick a subject, be it a still life, a figure, a landscape, we need to look for a light tone, a mid value, and a dark value, and then we need to look for the accents of the white and the very dark as represented by the border. Uh, in color, this would also mean that we need to have our color range to be in this area right here. This is where color is. Our next building block is alternation, and it basically means that we always need to place a dark against a light and a light against a dark. Now, at the focal point area, you would have a very stark light-dark contrast, because that's where the eye needs to go. As you get closer to the edge of the painting, that contrast would decrease, but you would still have alternation. This, in color, this would also teach that you need to place a light color next to a dark color. In the next building block, we're talking about silhouette, or silhouette shape. And what we basically need to think about there is that we pick a shape that really tells the story of what it should be. The outline should be clear. And in this particular case, the S reminds us of that very well because it's an interlocking shape. The background interlocks with the S, both in the white area as well as in the dark area, and they both are very readable. So that's the important thing in silhouette shape. The balance building block balances a triangle on its point, and it's a form of formal balance or symmetrical balance. It's not the type of balance that we usually do in a painting. In a painting, we deal more with asymmetrical balance or informal balance, but it still applies to values to the whites, we need to balance our whites, we need to balance our values, and we need to balance our colors. And so that's, not, although this is in black and white, we need to think color applies to all of these as well. Next, we looked at dominance, and dominance is, is so applicable to all the other building blocks as well. And in painting, we, we think of many forms of dominance. I'm sure you remember that some teacher has told you never to place the horizon line in the center of the painting, and therefore I came up with this particular design because here it is basically a foreground painting and the accent is sky. And that is uh, dominance of space division. But you can have dominance of, for instance, values. If you think of the predominant values that Rembrandt used, you immediately think in tonality, you think right in this area right up here. He used the, the, the mid values and the dark values predominantly, and then he had the accents of the light ones as well. And the same way he used the colors. If you think of shape dominance, and you think of Rubens, you think of very curvilinear shapes. 
if you think of Pete Mondrian, for instance, you think of all the rectangle, rectangular shapes. So that's dominance of shape, dominance of value. You could think of dominance of uh, temperature, all warm colors. You could think of dominance of color. It can be basically a blue picture or a red picture or a purple picture. So that, again, has dominance, plus the accent. If it's a blue picture, you would have orange or brownish accents, always the opposite. The next building block is gradation, and it really brings everything to life. Gradation means change. Do something. Change something. It is a from to situation, from light to dark or dark to light. Notice the background goes from dark to light, and the G goes from light to dark, which is reciprocal gradation we talked about. And it exists, and it makes everything come to life. Gradation applies to color as well. We can have analogous gradation. We can go from yellow to orange to red in that analogous form as, is, as it is on the color wheel. The next building block is depth. And when we think of uh, perspective, we're immediately thinking of linear perspective, with lines going in all directions. We artists are more concerned with atmospheric perspective. How, much, how many curtains of atmosphere are between us and what we're looking at? Imagine yourself driving through the mountains, and the distant mountain is much lighter than the mountain uh, closer to you. This applies to color as well. If you are uh, using color, don't use a warm color in the background because curtains of atmosphere make colors bluer, lighter, and more neutral, grayer. So keep your cool colors here and your warm colors up front. Our final building block is the focal point, which brings a lot of these other building blocks together. We are using, in the focal point, we're using gradation by making the edges a bit darker and building up towards the focal point area. We are using uh, the alternation. The lightest light and darkest dark contrast is right here at the focal point. We are using dominance as well. This is predominantly a square emphasized by these lines as well, the rectangular lines. So the accent is the circle. If this were in color and this were all green, then the, the dot would have to be a red dot to create the uh, alternation, that the uh, contrast that we need. Also, this points out that the rule of thirds, always place your focal point not in the center, but off to the third of the painting, either here or there, or there, or there. And that concludes the uh, eight building blocks. Now, the, the nice thing about these buildings block building blocks is that it's visual and you are visual, you're visually oriented, so this is a great thing for you as a visual artist to remember. The only problem is if you don't have these building blocks in front of you, they can't help you. And therefore I have created this building block poster which with, uh, with a little synopsis of all the different things that are apply to each building block. And all you need to do is send two dollars uh, for postage and handling, and we will mail this building block poster to you, absolutely free. Well, this concludes the uh, videos on the building blocks. I hope that you will start using them, re review what they all stand for, and good luck with applying them in your painting. <laughs>